Hey guys, this is an advanced writing class and we're going to be talking about um, how to analyze poetry and look at some Shakespeare. So you can come on in as soon as the button's green. Also, if you're uh, wondering why you can't join right away, the first two minutes are for people who have reservations. Um, you can get reservations on verbling.com slash get reservations, or you can become a premium member for 25 bucks a month, and it lets you have unlimited reservations and join as many classes as you want. Hey, Jose. Hello, teacher. How's it going? Oh, again. <laughs> oh, obviously. I think... No. Isn't it uh, 4 a.m. for you now? Yeah. <laughs> Are you getting tired? I think so, but I am just a little bit tired because I wake up like um like um like um <laughs> 1 p.m. 1 p.m. <laughs> so I get get up very late. So my bed, so it's okay. <laughs> it's like uh, my my time, my same time, all the time. This time I am just watching my computer. <laughs> cool. Yeah. But I don't think so that I will be sleeping like in 20 minutes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you might fall asleep in class, so if we hear snoring, we know that it's coming. No, from I I just have muted my mic. I will mute my mic. <laughs> All the time, I have muted my mic. <laughs> just right. when I am talking to you, I up I have right. opened my mic. Just right. when I am talking to you, I up I have right. opened my mic. Um. Got an echo coming from David. Just make sure you exit uh, verbling.com and get rid of that echo for us. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hello again. Lots of advanced classes this morning. <laughs> hey, guys. How's we know it sounds okay? Hey, guys. How's we know it sounds okay? David, uh, you're still echoing, so just exit verbling.com to get rid of the echo. Or pause the video. That's better. Hi, everybody. If you're watching, we still have some, some room, so you can come hang out with us if you want. Um, Leon answers my question. <laughs> Okay, so just to warm up, I think we've all kind of said hello already, so, um, or most of us, but I'd like you guys to just kind of tell, tell us your name, your country, where you're from, and I'm curious to know if you've ever studied Shakespeare, so in English or in your own language, it's been translated to many languages, so I'm just kind of curious if you've ever studied Shakespeare in school, um, so maybe Servet? No. No. <laughs> Never? Never. Never ever? Have you ever wanted to? Yeah, maybe, maybe I downloaded a book. I don't, I really don't know. Not. All right. Not, not what I think. <laughs> I don't know if Shakespeare's translated to Turkish, but I bet it probably is. <laughs> I yeah, think he's is. translated to pretty much every language. <laughs> um... David, what about you? Uh, yes, I I study a little, little, little Shakespeare in, in my high school, but but I didn't remember not well your poetry. 
Okay, you did some of his poems. All right, cool. Uh, what about you, Ava? Hello. Hello. Yeah, I've studied um, uh, Romeo and uh, Juliet. Uh, just a uh, fragment. Cool. Yeah. In English? Yes, in English. But I can't remember what, uh, how was the text, you know. It was about, I don't know, five or six years ago. All right, cool. And Gary, hello. Abdu, are you there? I can hear you, but maybe you can't hear me. OK, what about Huyen? Oh, I'm sorry, the question, what was oh, the question right. again? Just asking everyone if they've ever studied any Shakespeare at school in English or in their native language. Um, yeah, when I was in school, I studied Romeo and Juliet, and I also read uh, Hamlet and Macbeth. In English? Yeah, in English. Okay. Cool. And um, James? Yes. You ever studied yeah. Shakespeare? No, not no. Really. All right. What about you, Jose? Uh, Jose? Are you still awake? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Um, uh, sorry, what? What was the question? <laughs> oh, uh, I was asking if you guys have ever studied Shakespeare at school. Uh, no, I don't do that. <laughs> no? Okay. And Maria? Hi. Uh, yeah, um, I can't remember actually we have read Shakespeare at school, but I didn't study literature in college or anything, so, oh, okay. and in elementary school we don't do that. But I have read some on my own. All right. Do you um, like it? Yeah, yeah. I've also seen um, a play at the theater. The Midsummer Night's Dream. Oh, that's one of my favorite plays. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my verbling chat does not work, so oh. I just wanted to say hello, Huyen. <laughs> la, la, la. Respond hello, to Maria. Hi. <laughs> Mine's working. What's the problem with yours, uh, Maria? I don't know. When I type something, it doesn't show. So um, I'm someone recently the... told me that if you have the Grammarly plugin going at the same time, it doesn't work. She's, she's on okay. the regular chat, so mm -hmm. she needs to go to the verbling chat. Maria. Yeah, but the verbling chat does not work for me, so I just oh. added the, the other chat box. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Franco. Um, he's hanging outside because it's... So first um, thing we're going to do is just go a little bit over poetry analysis. Um, I'm not going to go too in-depth because I want us to have time to actually look at some Shakespeare, but I'm going to give you kind of an overview of how to analyze poetry. Um, and then we're going to look at one sonnet by Shakespeare, and it's modern translation because, as you may know, some of Shakespeare's language is a bit crazy, and <laughs> you might not understand it. Um, I am a native English speaker, and sometimes I don't know what he's saying, so it's it's because it's um it's because of the time period from in that he was writing in. So we have a modern translation to help us, and then we'll discuss it a little bit. Um, if we have time, we'll do two. Um, I don't expect we'll have time though, so we'll definitely do one. So I'm just going to give you guys the link to this website that I'm about to show you. So you can open it on your browser if you want to, but I'll share my screen as well. Um, so this is just kind of an overview of analyzing poetry. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, I'm going to kind of zoom through this first part getting started. So basically what you want to do is read the poem a few times. And you can try to do it out loud if that's helpful, but you need to read a poem more than once to analyze it. Um, it's good to have a copy that you can actually write on, like to annotate with a highlighter or a pen. Um, write down observations, questions, how you feel while you're reading, and pay particular attention to the beginning and the end. And then you can use the notes that you make 
as an entry point to begin your analysis. So you can kind of look back at what you've written, um, think about what elements have led you to feel a certain way or um, how you think the poet has achieved the, these effects on your feeling while you've been reading. So you can use your notes to kind of start to brainstorm what you're going to write. It says, always keep in mind that the poet uses poetic devices to achieve a particular effect. So breaking up the poem into formal poetic components enhance your understanding of the overall theme, tone, etc. So does anyone know what a poetic device is or a literary device? It's like a figure of speech. That's one of them. Yeah, figures okay. of speech. Yeah, alliteration. I know what an ad alliteration, alliteration is. Alliteration is one, yeah. Yeah. Uh, og uh, another one, it starts with O. Ox. Ox. Starts with an O? Yes. Let me take a look. Like Ryan? Oxymoron? Or? Yes, oxymoron. Okay. <laughs> I've got this other website. I'm not <laughs> going to look at it today, but it's a pretty good um, list of some of the main literary devices. We've got allegory, alliteration, illusion, um, conflict, um, hyperbole, imagery, mood. All of these things are literary devices or poetic devices. So you can analyze literature looking at these different devices, but a lot of the time when you're analyzing a book, um, it's not always the author's intent to use these devices. With poetry, it's pretty intentional. Like they're intending to rhyme, they're intending to use a certain meter. Um, generally speaking, poetry, they, they try to evoke certain images and things like that. So with poetry, um, there's almost always intentional use of, of literary devices. So it says, keep in mind that the poet uses devices to achieve a certain effect. And when you're analyzing, it's helpful to kind of break down the poem um, that you're analyzing. Um, using some of these devices. So thinking about metaphor, theme, things like that. And then you can kind of um, mold all of this together into a cohesive thesis and start to think about the content. So these are kind of just things to keep in mind. Um, some of the main elements that you want to think about with poetry are content, language, imagery, and form, and syntax. Okay, so those are kind of the main elements that you want to think about when you're analyzing poetry. And they've broken them down into sub-contents. So the content meaning how does the tone of the speaker and the context of the poem change your understanding. You want to think about the speaker how they're involved. There's a big list of questions here that you can think about. Is it a specific person? Um, are they from a certain time period? Are they speaking in the first person, second person perspective? So you want to think about the speaker. The tone. So how is the tone of the poem developed through the language? So how, how do you know what tone means, first of all? Yes. So what, what was <laughs> What are some examples of what a uh, tone might be of a poem? Is the overall um, help me, Ryan? Yes, yes. <laughs> the overall, yes. <laughs> the overall the sound. sound, not sound exactly, but I think it's the like the color of the mood. mood. Color that he, mood, yeah, yeah. The mood, yeah. The overlying kind of feeling or emotion that you get while you're reading the poem. So you could have a very gloomy tone, like Edgar Allan Poe writes very gloomy, dark poetry, versus um, an, another poet writing about like flowers might be writing a very happy, bright toned poem. Um, so yeah, it's kind of about the writer's voice. So the, the mood the overlying tone of a poem. So you can think about tone um, and how the tone is creating imagery. Um, think about if it's consistent. Is it the same tone at the beginning and the end? You can also think about tension. So is there any sort of conflict happening in the poem, in the actual context of the poem? Um, and you can think about context. When was it written? 
um, what were the social, political, historical, etc. issues of that time. That's one way to frame a histor an historical analysis is to look at the context surrounding the poem. So first thing you think about is content. So look at the speaker, the tone, tension, and context. And then you want to think about language, especially with poetry. So you think about word choice. What ch words have they chosen to use? Are they writing formally or conversationally? You can think about meaning. What are the connotations and denotations of certain words? Is there any repetition? Things like that. Any metaphors? And then the rhythm. So poetry usually has an identifiable rhythm of some sort. Either it has a certain number of syllables in each line. Um, there's, there might be alliteration. It might have some sort of musicality to it where there's, you know, eight syllables in a line and the last syllables always rhyme, things like that. So you want to think about language. And this is where these literary devices come in. You start to think about, you can see this big list over here. There's a lot of crazy terms. Um, but you start to think about things like metaphor, symbol, what sort of language are they using. And then you think about imagery. How does the imagery construct the poem's theme, tone, and purpose? So visuals. Is there anything in the poem that gives you a certain sense, makes you feel a certain way? Metaphors, symbolism. Again, so what images are painted in your mind as you're reading and why? So you start to think about that. Um, form. So this is more technical, thinking about the structure of the poem. What type of poem is it? For example, a sonnet. Today we're going to look at a sonnet by Shakespeare. Um, does it follow the structure? Does it deviate from the structure at all? Um, think about the stanzas and the lines. How many lines are there? Is there a pattern? The rhyme scheme. What sort of rhyme is there? Does it rhyme? So a lot of poetry doesn't rhyme at all. Okay. And then lastly, you want to think about syntax. So this is similar to structure, it's part of structure, but it's a little bit more specific. Thinking about the actual verbs, if they're active or passive, um, enjambment means how the words are put together, how the, line, how the words are put together, sorry, how lines are broken up, um, how they're, is there, it says are they broken before a grammatical or log logical completion of a thought, do they stop at the end, things like this. Think about sentence structure. Are they using full sentences or fragments? What sort of punctuation do they use? Sometimes there's crazy punctuation in poetry, like random semicolons and stuff that aren't grammatically correct. A lot of poetry doesn't use grammatical conventions, really. So that's a very brief overview. But basically, um, you want to think about, again, the content, what's going on in the poem and the speaker. What sort of language is the poet using? What sort of images do they evoke in your mind while you're reading? What do you think about? Um, and how is the poem structured? And what does that mean? So these are all different things that you can kind of think about when you're reading. Um, Gary has a microphone problem. Taking a look at the chat. Yes. If you're watching, uh, we've got a couple of seats, so you can come hang out with us if you want to. So I know I went through that really quickly. But that's because we're not going to do a super in-depth analysis today. It's just kind of to give you an overview of the idea of analyzing poetry. Basically, the first thing that you need to do is just brainstorm. So read the poem a few times. Make sure you understand what's going on. And then you start to make notes about themes and symbols and things like that. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? Do you, have you done this in school? in any sort of literature class? No. Yes, but not so complete with so many definitions and uh, so complex uh, terms. Yeah. <laughs> on the Literary Devices uh, website, there's some pretty complex terms going on over there, right? Um, we're not going to really dig into that today. Um, we're thinking mostly about symbols, so symbolism, and themes. So what sort of symbols are in the poem? What, what is a symbol in literature? Can anyone tell me what a symbol is? 
Is it similar to a metaphor? Or... Yep. Usually it's some sort of concrete object that represents something else. So it's like a metaphor. Okay. So like a, an animal or a, a thing, something physical, a specific thing that's representing something else. And then a theme is more just general, general themes within a poem or a piece of work. And then we're also going to think about tone, um, tone of voice and the mood. So we're not going to dig too much into the complicated terms today, um, just some of the kind of general terms. So let's read a sonnet. We'll read it in its original form, maybe twice, and see how much we understand. And then we'll look at the modern translation to make sure we really understand it. Okay. And then we'll do a little bit of analysis. Um, practice of representing things. Yeah, exactly. Jose, exactly. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. So we're looking at Sonnet 18. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day is what it's titled. Okay, it's by Shakespeare. Um, who would like to read some Shakespeare? Anybody? I like it. <laughs> I would like to read it. Would you like me to read it once first, or do you want to just go for it? Just go for it. Poyan, you go. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more, thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough wines do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy internal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair, though <laughs> oust. <laughs> oust. Nor shall death break though wonders in his shape, when in eternal lines to time though roast. So long as man can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Oh, that was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I don't okay. understand. <laughs> yeah, you might not understand the first time, but you will understand by the end of class, <laughs> okay? Um, so I'm going to read it now once so you can hear some of the pronunciation, and then I'm going to get someone else to read it. So we will have read it together three times, and then we'll start to kind of pick it apart, okay? So, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou oust, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in its shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growst. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Okay. <laughs> Do you still not understand anything? <laughs> yeah, I think I'm understanding more. Yeah, the I'm more you hear reading. it and, and read it, the, uh, it'll start to become a little bit more clear. So... We've done it twice. Does anyone else want to read? I would like to try. Okay, go ahead, Maria. Okay. Uh, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his cold complexion dimmed. And every fair, fair from fair sometimes declines, 
by chance, chance, or nature's changing course untrimmed. By, but thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair though thou owest, nor shall death brag though wanderst in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as man can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. Should we do it one more time? Yeah, I will do it. Okay, go ahead. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day, thou art more lovely and more temperate? Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's leaves hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fear from fear sometime declines. By chance or nature's changing course and trimmed, but the eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fear thou owest, nor shall death break thou one uh, wanders in his shade, when internal lines to time thou grows, gro uh, So long as man can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Perfect. Okay. Let's break it down just a little bit first um, by looking at the words that are in Old English. Okay, so the first one is the. What does the mean? Does anyone know? You. In the. It would be the, but the with two e's like this in Old English. What does that mean? You. You. Yeah. So Cal, shall I compare you to a summer's day? So the means you. Um, what's the next? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. What is thou? Your. You. <laughs> I can. Okay. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Shall I compare you? Nice to see thee, yeah. <laughs> nice to see thee too, Hoyan. Um, it's also very hard to read this without a British accent for me because Shakespeare was British. And it sounds much better with a British accent, I think. But, um, Jose, do you want to you want to try to read? Okay, let's go through uh, really quickly with with these words in Old English, and then we'll read it again, and maybe it'll make more sense. Okay, um, so we've got thee and thou. What about hath in this line? And summer's lease hath all too short a date. Has. Has good. Has. Um, Okay, next one. Thy. Thy eternal summer shall not fade. The. <laughs> your. Be thou thy. Okay. Your. Thy, yeah. thy is your. 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 Okay. So, but your eternal summer shall not fade. Thy eternal summer. Um, nor lose possession of that fair you. Okay, oust. Um, any guesses on what this might mean? Uh. What you owl. own own. Yeah, so it comes from own. It's kind of like a short form for ownest. So mm -hmm. in in modern English it would just be own or have. Okay, so so it says nor lose possession of that fair you have or you own. Okay. Nor shall death brag thou again. Wanderest in his shade. What does this mean? Wanderest. Wonder, maybe. Yeah, I coming. Yeah. I mean, you can guess, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Wander, right? So, wa what does it mean to wander? To go around. Yeah, like walk around, um, mosey. <laughs> okay. Um, when in eternal lines to time, thou, again, you grossed. Yeah, grow. Grow. Okay. So he likes to add st to the end of things, right? Mm -hmm. Roast. Um, so long as men can breathe, their eyes can see. So long lives this, and this is life to thee, to you. Okay, so just to kind of break down a few of the weird words there. Um, and uh, Hoseway, would you like to read it once? 
Leslie? I can't hear you. Click your microphone. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay. I I will try this. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so it's so I compared tea to a summer day to a more lovely and more temperate raw wine to, to say the early birth of May. And summer leaves had all too short a date. Sometimes too hot the a the eye of heaven shine and often is his gold completion dime then mm -hmm. uh, and every fire from price sometimes declines by chance or natural tension course untrimmed 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 yeah. I'm trim. But this is Ty, Ty, the next Ty Eternal? Ty or T? Um, by nature's change, uh, by thy, thy. By thy, thy eternal summer shore, not, not pay, nor lose possession of that part, that part. So um, now shall now shall the dead brow to to wonders in his shape mm -hmm. when his eternal line to to time to worlds worlds so long as men can break or eyes can see so long life so long live. This and his give he, his sorry, and this gives life to be. Good. I really like the last two lines. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> the best I can see. Okay. I um, can okay. So, should we try to talk about it a little bit? Yeah. Okay. So, what what do you think it means? We've read it, I think, five, five or six times now. So, what do you get from it? What is he saying? No, do not use these words in conversation. <laughs> if you go up to your friend and go, oh, hello, uh, tis so nice to see thee. Um, what hast thou been doing? <laughs> We're like, what the? What's going on? <laughs> right? So, maybe if you're joking with someone, but aside from that, no, you'll sound pretty funny. Um, so, overall, what do you think this poem is, is about? What do we understand? It's a love poem. Good, it's a love poem. Let's start. So it's a love poem. I think uh, he wrote this for a girl. Okay. A woman, yeah. And then he compared, um, I don't know what, with uh, life and death. Yep. Yeah. Um, Yep, he's talking about, so we're, it's um, talking about love, life and death. I think he's, confess he's confessing his love. Yeah, so he's Worship confessing, you. or you can say he's professing his love. Anything else? Okay, let's go through it line by line. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? How would you say that in modern English? The, the you are beautiful like, like a summer's day. Or something. Yeah, can, can I compare you to a summer's day? You're as beautiful as a summer's day, right? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. It's like there are a lot of beautiful girls out there, but you're beautiful. Yeah, so you're more lovely and more beautiful than a summer's day, right? Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. So it's saying that she's more temperate, and then it starts talking about the weather, right? It's saying there's rough winds in May, 
Um, summer doesn't last long enough. Sometimes it's too hot. So he's saying that she's more temperate than the crazy weather of the summer. Mm -hmm. um, summer doesn't last long enough. It's all too short a date. Sometimes it's too hot. Um, sometimes too hot, the eye of heaven shines. What is the eye of heaven? It's the sun. The sun. The sun, yeah. It's a very uh, poetic way of saying the sun, right? Yeah. And often is his gold complexion dimmed. So it's not as shiny? It's cloudy. Yeah, so it's <laughs> Shakespeare's making this very complicated, right? <laughs> 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 like, come on, just say it gets sunny and cloudy. <laughs> Say it how it is, Willie. Okay. Uh, and every fair from fair sometime declines by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. What the? <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. So every fair from fair sometimes declines by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. Maybe we, we can't define this yet, but don't worry. I have a modern translation over here. You just haven't seen it. <laughs> But your eternal summer shall not fade. What a beautiful thing to say to someone, right? You, you are yeah. always shining. You're yeah. brighter than the sun, right? <laughs> your eternal summer will not fade. Um, nor lose possession of that fair thou oust. So remember this means like own or have. Mm -hmm. So it's saying also you won't lose possession of how fair you are, the fairness that you have. Do you, fairness back then means uh, beauty, right? Okay. So calling someone fair is calling them beautiful. So in, um, in uh, a lot of poetry and a lot of fairy tales and things, you see someone say, um, like, the fair princess. She's so beautiful. Or the, the fair queen. So fair means beautiful and precious. So they're saying that she has a lot of fairness or beauty and that will never fade. She won't lose possession of it. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade. Nor means like neither, right? Mm -hmm. So also, any idea how, how you can break this apart? He, w uh, he don't want um, she died. Yeah. Exactly. So it's talking about death. N nor will death brag you to wander in its shade. So it's talking about her walking um, amongst the dead kind of thing, talking yeah. about death not wanting to die. Mm -hmm. um, when in eternal lines to time thou grossed, talking about her growing over time or getting older, mm -hmm. eternal lines might be like wrinkles, right? Yeah. Um, and then at the end it says, so long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. So, what is this? Love. I. Yes, um. love. Or? I think he's talking about himself. Okay, or himself. So he could be saying, so long lives this, like, so I will live and give life to you. It could also be talking about the poem. It's saying, mm -hmm. as long as men are alive and can see, this poem will live on and give you life. So it's talking about, like, immortalizing her. Have you heard this before? Uh, yeah. Um, make her um, eternal. Yeah, making her eternal through his poetry. Yeah. yeah, because in his poem he's describing her beauty, right? He's saying, oh, you're so beautiful, you're like the summer, and he's going on describing how fair and beautiful she is. And then at the end he's saying, as long as men are alive and this poem exists, you will exist through my words, right? Wow. So it could be talking about love. It's saying, like, his love for her is eternal. Um, it could also be referring just to the poem and saying, as long as the poem is here, you will live on. You're so beautiful. <laughs> very romantic, but he really like um, makes things very wordy just to get a very simple idea across, right? So that's Shakespeare for you. <laughs> very typical, right? Um, yeah, so does it make more sense when you kind of break it apart like that, line by line? 
Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at, I found this online, I didn't translate it myself, but here's a modern translation that I found. Um, how about uh, Servet, do you want to read our modern translation? Yeah. Shall I compare you to a summer's day? You are more lovely and more moderate. Moderate. Harsh winds disturb the delicate buds of May, and summer doesn't last long enough. Sometimes the sun is too hot, and its golden face is often <laughs> dimmed by clouds. All beautiful things eventually become less beautiful, either by life experience or by the passing of time. But your eternal beauty won't fade, or nor lose of any lose any of its quality, and you will never die as you will as you will live on in my enduring poetry. As long as there are people still alive to read poems, the sonnet will live, and you will live in it. <laughs> okay, so. Here's the simplified version, right? So basically what we just broke it down to. Sometimes the sun is too hot, but you're more beautiful than the sun. Your eternal beauty, beauty won't fade. You will live on in my enduring poetry. As long as people are alive, this sonnet will live, and you'll live in it. So it's, it's a kind of a beautiful idea, right? He's trying to immortalize her in his words. Um, it doesn't have the same rhythm. No. <laughs> no. No. It loses the beauty of the poem. It really destroys the poem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I um, ask a question? Okay. Bye, Josue. Josue is falling asleep. It's like almost 5 a.m. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> okay. Perkin, I understand that you don't know the words. Um, none of us do, right? So this is what we're doing. We're we're breaking it apart. Um, and yeah, you have a question, Maria? Yeah, can you pull up your screen again? Oh, sorry. Because yeah. I, uh, of I which question. version? The classic or the...? The classic. Yep. So I see up to temperate, date, untrim. There's a little punctuation that I don't know the name. What is a colon. That? A colon. So why did he put a colon after okay, the line? Okay, so thou art... So I'm just going to copy and... First of all, look at the poem. There is one period right there at the end, right? So technically, this is one enormous sentence, but it's not really one sentence, right? This is, this is something that happens quite regularly in poetry. There's a strange use of punctuation. Um, it's not technically following proper grammatical structure. So he's using commas and colons to show a pause. When he uses a colon, it comes before something else that has the same idea. So it's, um, for example, in the first one, thou art more lovely and more temperate, colon, and then he continues to talk about the weather. Right? And then he says, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Summer isn't long enough. And then he continues to talk about summer, how it's too hot. Okay, so he's using the colons kind of how we would grammatically correctly use a semicolon. Um, and it's hard to explain why, but there's a lot of crazy punctuation in poetry that is kind of difficult to explain. And it's just the poet's choice of different ways to get people to pause at the end of a line. Um, in this case, it, I mean, it's not grammatically correct, right? You can't have what is this, 12 lines or 15 lines with one period, right? It doesn't work that way. And all of the capitals and everything. So um, let me find another link here. So, Shakespeare didn't know punctuation. Well, I, <laughs> I wouldn't say that. I think he probably did, but um, I'm trying to... F I had a good source to on punctuation. Yeah, so basically just punctuation in poetry is not the same as punctuation in grammatically correct language, basically. <laughs> and I don't really know how else to explain it. He uses the question mark properly, and that's about it. 
<laughs> <laughs> so it's um, just one of those things where in poetry you don't think of it as being grammatically correct when you're reading it. Like some poetry there you won't see any capital letters through the entire poem and there will be all sorts of crazy spacing and um, just a semicolon after every single line and then no period at all and it's like why? <laughs> so it's part of the poet's um, decision when they're writing and that's something that you can kind of try to break down and analyze when you're doing an analysis is think about you know why is he using these colons why is he putting them there um, but when you write like a letter or an article or some other sort of text you usually don't use semicolons or colons do you? Um, I use semicolons when I'm writing essays and things um, you use a colon generally before you're about to list something that's the most common use of a colon okay. um, and you usually use a semicolon when you have um, a run-on sentence that you want to kind of split but it oh it's hard to explain use a semicolon <laughs> here so. yeah I understand what you mean yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, yeah. First one yeah, sentence. and no, I mean you can use you can use them in in everyday writing. It's not that uncommon. Um, but the point is that Shakespeare's not using them grammatically correctly. So don't go by Shakespeare for how to use punctuation. Not in the poetry anyway. Um, but you can use colons and semicolons in like letters and essays and things. Uh, I have another question. Yeah, sure. I'll bring. Um, does this does this uh, poem have any rules? In terms of sentence, yes, yes. So what kind so, of rule is so that? Let's, let's look at the structure. How many syllables are in each line? Take a minute. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll do. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. It's ten. Ten. And there's a rhythm, right? This is how you're this is how you're technically supposed to read it with this rhythm. It's called iambic pent pentameter. Um, let me find. Okay, here's a little resource on iambic pentameter. So Shakespeare's sonnets. Shakespearean sonnet basics, it says. <laughs> Iambic pentameter. So it says Shakespeare's sonnets are written, um, I'll give you guys this link. Iambic, okay. Are written predominantly in a meter called Iambic pentameter. It's a rhyme scheme where each sonnet line consists of ten syllables. Okay, the syllables are divided into five pairs called iams or iambic feet. So it's in iambic pentameter and the way that you're supposed to read it is like this. The first syllable is unstressed and the second is stressed. Ba-boom, 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 ba-boom. Here's some examples. When I do count the clock that tells the time. When in disgrace with four tune end men's eyes. This is kind of how it's meant to be read so it does have a rhythm to it. So generally speaking, all of the sonnet, sonnets are in iambic pentameter, so with the ten syllables per line. Um, and they also generally have 14 lines. Um, let me continue here. So structure, there's 14 lines. The first 12 are divided into three quatrains with four lines each that establishes the, the theme or the problem and then the final two lines are called a couplet and this is the resolution to the problem so there's a rhyme scheme right here A B A B C D C D E F E F so if we look back at the poem A is day me. and may rhyme right temperate date they don't quite rhyme but they rhyme in Shakespeare language okay Shine, decline, dimmed, untrimmed, fade, shade, oust, grossed, kind of, rhyme, right? So they're broken into these groups of four. One, two, three, and there's three of them. And then the last two lines rhyme 
and this is called a couplet and it's supposed to be kind of the conclusion or the resolution of the poem so this is a pretty so general structure that applies to all of his sonnets they're all in iambic pentameter with the ten syllables and they're you're meant to, to say them with that sort of rhythm um, they all are broken into this sort of rhyme scheme so it's A B A B C D C D E F E F G G do you understand what I mean when I type it in letters like that? Yeah. yeah. It's about the rhyme. Yeah, it's just about the rhyme scheme. Okay, so to, to read this in iambic pentameter, it would be like, Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Some time too hot for... Too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. You see, so you don't have to emphasize it quite that much, but that's kind of the idea of how the rhythm kind of works with with Shakespeare's sonnets. Um, what else can I tell you? That's kind of the the main point about sonnets. So the structure and the rhyme scheme. And yes, it, it's called iambic pentameter. I'll put that in there. Iambic pentameter. So. Ten syllable lines, first syllable unemphasized, second emphasized. Is that clear? Do you understand? Any more? Any questions? Am I confusing you? No. Not still clear. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, Penta is ten, exactly. Okay, so let's look back at the poem. Um, the original version, because I really, really dislike this modern version. Uh, to me, it's like destroying Shakespeare. But it is helpful because it helps you understand what's going on, right? Um, okay, bye, David. <laughs> um, so we've read the poem a whole bunch of times, right? We've broken it down and made sure that we understand what it all means, kind of got an overall meaning. So this is really what you need to do when you're reading Shakespeare and other poetry that's written partly in Old English. You need to really break it down and understand it before you can analyze it. So the next step would be to kind of start to analyze. So I've got some questions that you would think about to kind of start your analysis that you would write. So generally, what is it about? What is the speaker saying and who is he speaking to? Is there an underlying message? How is he achieving this message? And what are some themes? How would you describe tone of voice? So these are all things that you can kind of think about after you've read it and you want to actually start analyzing. So we've already kind of determined that it's about a girl, right? The guy speaking, Shakespeare. Yeah. Yeah. It's about a girl. It's a love poem. Mm -hmm. And what he's trying to do is um, immortalize her or it, it, through his words. So keep her forever beautiful in his poem, right? Um, so, <laughs> so themes. So what are some themes? Love. Summer. Summer, okay. What else? Weather. Sun. Weather, yeah, weather comes up. Beauty. Eternity. Eternity, that's a good one. Death. Death, yeah, death comes up. And he tries to put a spin on Philosophy. it. Philosophy. Right? He's trying to make death kind of beautiful in a way, right? He's saying, like, even though you're going to die, you will always live on in my poem. So he brings up death, but it's not in a gloomy way, right? Like I, I mentioned Edgar Allan Poe before because he writes a lot of very gloomy poetry. Um, in his poems, death is usually pretty dark. But in this poem, he's kind of talking about how you will die. Eternal lines will grow, right? You'll get wrinkles um, and you'll die. But even then, you'll still live on. So he's trying to make death kind of beautiful. Summer, yeah. Um, and symbols, I would say that the sun is more of a symbol because it's more of a specific thing rather than an overall theme or idea. 
So what does the sun symbolize? What do you think the sun symbolizes or represents in the poem? The girl. I think it's the youth of the girl. The, yeah. Um, yeah. When she is young. And the yeah. shine of the girl, like the beauty of the girl. Right, she's young and she's shining and she's beautiful. And then it says sometimes his complexion is dimmed. So even though you don't see the word clouds, the clouds could be a symbol as well, right? So if the sun is symbolizing her youth, then what are the clouds symbolizing? The, uh, the Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, when she is old. Yeah, so her, her growth... Um, as she gets older, her beauty is maybe dimming, or her complexion is dimming. So the clouds are kind of representing her growing older. The sun is maybe representing her young, being young and beautiful. Mm. Do you see any other symbols in here? So a symbol would be a concrete thing that represents something else. So if we say the sun and the clouds. Symbol. What about in this line? Which line? I've tried to highlight it. Um, rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. The wind is Good. the symbol. The wind? What do you what think? Is, what is buds? Bud? All the hardness. The buds? The buds are the little thing that you see okay. on them okay. before a flower grows. <laughs> uh, okay. 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 Um, so the wind could be a symbol and the buds, the flower buds. So what would the wind symbolize? Harshness. Yeah. Life? It could just symbolize or whatever yeah. trouble. Yeah, exactly. So everything that she's facing in her life, you could oh. say. Yeah. Um, and this is shaking the darling buds of May. So it's literally saying that wind makes the flowers shake and rustle in the grass, right? Mm -hmm. But you could say figuratively it's saying that the rough wind or her life, what she goes through, is shaking the darling buds or the... Um, what could buds symbolize? The fl flower buds. Young women. Yeah. Yeah, I mean flowers... Flowers are very often a symbol of womanhood, hmm. um, femininity. So a bud would be her, you know, on the verge of growing into a woman, right? Hmm. You could say the wind Maybe is... Maybe she's juvenile. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so to kind of start... There's a lot more we can say about the poem, but to kind of start to, to form it into an analysis, what you can do is look at your notes. So what we have for notes, for themes, we've got... Weather, summer, love. For symbols, we have the sun, clouds, the wind, flower buds. What do all of these things have in common? Weather, sun, wind, flower buds. Nature. 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 And at one point, he says, by chance or nature's changing course, untrimmed. It's talking about the eternal summer, nature, the sun's gold complexion, heaven. He's talking about a summer's day, right? So the whole comparison is based um, on comparing her to elements of nature. So that's actually a good place to start with an analysis, is you could write um, an analysis titled something like nature in Sonnet 18, or the comparison of women to nature, femininity to nature, beauty to nature, things like this. Human beauty to natural beauty. So if you kind of get, like, gather your notes and your little bits and pieces, you can piece it together into an analysis. Um, who likes this poem? <laughs> well, I like it more now. Yeah. Than I like it a lot. Yeah, so, you like it once you understand it, right? The yeah. first time you read any Shakespeare, it's like, oh my gosh, like, what is going on? And then once you get to understand it, I think it's beautiful. I really like it. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a nice message. Mm. Yeah. Um, cool.
pretty much done. <laughs> um, I'll give you guys this document. Actually, at the end of the document, there's a little analysis. I'll put it in the chat. This is not my analysis. It's somebody else's. But I pasted it there if you're interested. <laughs> and what I'll about the other poem? I think you had two. Yeah, there is two. Um, we don't have time, so maybe we'll do it in another class. Okay. I've never done Shakespeare online before, so I wanted to see if, and if it would work, <laughs> if you guys are interested. Mm -hmm. So... Um, Here's a preview. Yeah. Sonnet 116. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe we'll do it in another class. I remember I have a Shakespeare book in my uh, closet. Oh. It lies, lies there maybe for 10 years. <laughs> Maybe you should blow the dust off of it and see if you yeah. can uh, find yes. the sonnets. Yes. Um, it was uh, Romeo and Juliet. Uh, it's Turkish. Oh, I love Romeo and Juliet. So you can you tell translation sure. sometimes damage the poem. Like you should read it in its original language. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I agree. <laughs> and it's good to read a version that has um, a lot of annotations. Um, like a lot of versions, they'll fully annotate Shakespeare for you. So the words that you don't understand, there will be an annotation over in the side, so it explains or defines the words of Old English mm -hmm. for you. Um. Thank thee. Yes. Thank thee all for joining me. Thank <laughs> thee. Uh, here's my Facebook. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll do another Shakespeare class next week or something. Um, I like talking about it, so. <laughs> all right, cool. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay, bye. 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 bye, -bye.